This is CBC Here and Now. I'm live in Bay Roberts tonight talking about the craft beer industry as one small company elsewhere in the province struggles to get its start. And diving operations halted at the salmon cleanup in Fortune Bay after an injury at that site. We'll have an update on the cleanup on the south coast a little later on Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. A warning though, we're starting with a serious and sensitive story. Hundreds of young people were physically and sexually abused in Newfoundland and Labrador institutions over many decades. Government officials knew it, but they covered it up. That's what's alleged in a recently certified class action lawsuit that is seeking tens of millions of dollars in compensation. Here now is Mark Quinn with that story. The of the day was more concerned about the embarrassment of this coming forward than they were about protecting children. What's being claimed is shocking and heartbreaking. Children who are the most vulnerable that you could possibly imagine. There's nobody at home looking out for them. There's nobody in the institutions looking out for them. And then they're abused in this way. Imagine having your clothes removed and being beaten with a strap. Lawyers say they revealed a pattern of behavior that dates back to at least the 1950s at the Whitburn Youth Centre. Boys here were sent to a veterinarian for medical care. So they were literally treated like animals. Years later, that same veterinarian was convicted of sexually assaulting several of the boys. So he used his position to sexually abuse the boys. Moore says it was not an isolated case, but a systemic problem that continued at youth facilities in Pleasantville, Waterford Bridge Road and Whitburn throughout the 1970s and 1980s. Part of the a uh, claim as well is that the government uh, fraudulently concealed knowledge that the residents in the institution suffered sexual battery and other sexual misconduct. Moore says it's a problem identified by Justice Samuel Hughes in 1989 at the inquiry he led into sexual abuse at Mount Cashel. Commissioner Hughes said that the civil servants showed an appetite for concealment. And this appetite for concealment it's our submission that this appetite for concealment goes back uh, to the 1950s and that it continued. Um, well, we just saw it with the Muskrat Falls inquiry. The class action lawsuit now includes 60 people claiming they were abused in province-run facilities between 1973 and 1989. Moore and her colleagues expect there may be as many as 500 more people who haven't come forward yet. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. You had the tunnel true, non-stop traffic, uh, better for business, better for tourism. The federal Liberals say if elected, they'll support building a tunnel to Labrador, an intriguing electoral ploy for people who've been waiting days for the ferry. Finally starting to see these near seasonal temperatures across the board reaching uh, the double digits for most of us. The hot spot uh, was actually up through Happy Valley Goose Bay reached a high near 16 degrees this afternoon. Now the first half of the day was lovely, but we did see plenty of cloud cover move in. We're starting to see some rain on the west coast. The uh, radar is out of service right now, so you can't see the rain, but it certainly is falling. That's going to spread east as we head through the night tonight. We have quite a bit of rain on the way for parts of the west coast. I'll have all the details coming up. Well, to Cornerbrook now, where the RCMP is being called in to investigate after a car crashed into a house, killing the driver. It happened Saturday night, just after 9.30. A patrol officer attempted to stop a vehicle on Main Street, but according to the RNC, the driver didn't stop. The vehicle was spotted again a short time later on Caribou Road, where it had crashed into this house. The 20-year-old driver died at hospital. There's no word on his identity. The RCMP is called in to oversee any investigation in which an RNC officer is involved in a case involving serious injury or death. Once the outside investigation is completed, Newfoundland and Labrador's serious incident response team will independently review those findings. A trial date has been set in connection with the death of Justin Pollard from St. John's, but it's not until next fall. 
Thomas Whittle from CBS will go on trial on September 14th, 2020. Whittle was in a Cornerbrook court this morning to set dates for that trial. He's in the middle of applying for legal aid representation. Justin Pollard died following a snowmobile accident near the Humber Valley Resort in February of 2017. He was 21 years old. A year later, Whittle was charged with impaired operation of a vehicle causing death. Up to 18 witnesses are expected to be called during the judge and jury trial. Two more cases of E. coli illness have been confirmed, bringing the total number of sick now to 24. The number of confirmed cases started climbing last week, and as Here and Now's Cease Hair reports, the hunt for answers about the source of the E. coli is on, but it could take a while. It is difficult to say. Uh, we have a lot of people uh, from a lot of different areas. Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, the province's medical officer of health, says two new cases of E. coli brings the total to 24, most of those in an area covered by Eastern Health. And the source of this outbreak remains a mystery. One problem is the 2 to 10 day incubation period. It can take a while to feel sick after eating contaminated food. That means the bacteria can be inside someone's system for that period of time before they become symptomatic. So. If you think uh, someone could have been exposed to something 10 days prior, trying to remember what you ate 10 days prior is, is a difficult situation, right? Difficult thing to do, so. This story started last week after a MUN student living in residence complained she got sick from the dining hall on campus. Memorial University points out that to date, there's no evidence that links the dining hall and sick students. The university tells us that the company providing food at the dining hall has taken a preventative measure and has shut down all self-serve stations. That means all food is now being served from behind the counter. As for the source of the outbreak, officials will know more from testing that's underway at Canada's National Microbiology Lab. They actually look at the genetic makeup of the bacteria that grow and uh, give us an idea if they're all related to each other or if they're related to other uh, out, uh, outbreaks or cases that may have occurred uh, elsewhere in the country, sometimes even outside of the country. Fitzgerald says sometimes the source of an outbreak is obvious and quickly known, but Sometimes, like this outbreak, they're not so lucky, and it takes a while to figure out what the common contamination source is. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Turning now to transportation in southern Labrador, where many are fed up with the ferry service there. A delay last week brought more talk about a tunnel and a system which would link the straits to the big land. And support for the tunnel has surfaced in this federal election campaign. Here now's Troy Turner has this report now from St. Barb. They've been here before, on the dock in St. Barb, waiting. The Kayak W is delayed, this time a power outage. It wouldn't be an issue if they could drive to Labrador. The ferries are not reliable, especially during the winter months. When you're long waits, they can't contend with the ice. And uh, when you consider the amount of money that's spent on, on ferries, uh, a tunnel might be a good idea. It would save money in the long run, I think. A tunnel to connect Labrador is a federal election promise from the Liberals. A new promise for an old idea. Last year, a study by the provincial Liberals put the price tag for a tunnel at $1.5 billion. The Conservative government before them also danced with the idea of a fixed link. Now that the notion is back as a federal election campaign promise, what do people think? Uh, what's sitting in front of us right here uh, is a great barrier for Labrador, for sure. You had the tunnel true, non-stop traffic, uh, better for business, better for tourism, better for everybody. It's all about timing for the Liberals' fixed link commitment. This ferry is new and a frustration for some travelers. Well, it's a big issue now, but the ferry, where she can't go, where they're having a lot of trouble with the wind, the southwest wind, and uh, she can't cross any more than 25 kilometers or something, southwest. No party is promising to build the tunnel. The Liberals are the only ones to signal that they support the idea. For some people, they've heard all this before. The tunnel idea would be great, uh, but the federal or and provincial governments need to stop uh, 
wasting money into study? Well, the dock here is cleared and the boat has again set sail for the coast of Labrador. We've heard loud and clear that they want this tunnel to become reality. What that'll mean and how it translates at the ballot box on October 21st remains to be seen. In St. Barb, Troy Turner, CBC News. Now, staying with Southern Labrador, 285 people had their power knocked out this morning. An early morning fire at the diesel plant in Charlottetown sparked the outage. Neighboring Pinson's arm is also in the dark and it's not clear how badly damaged the plant is or how long it's going to take to restore power. No one was injured in the fire. The health center in Charlottetown does have a backup generator and it's operating as usual, but the town that does not have a backup. Well, police in St. John's showed off a remarkable haul of weapons, drugs, cash and cars seized in a recent bust. That's a 44 caliber Magnum and that was also loaded and you see some ammunition there in the picture as well. More than 90 charges are pending in what the RNC is calling Operation Ragged. The case began last March after several homes in the city were shot at and firebombed. On September 18th, a series of coordinated raids resulted in six arrests and a mountain of evidence, including cocaine, pills, luxury vehicles, brass knuckles you see there, $200,000 in cash, money counters, a taser, a machete, and seven firearms. RNC Superintendent Sean O'Reilly says the officers who conducted the raids put their personal safety on the line. You know, every time our officers enter into a residence or some other place to search and they find a load of firearms, obviously it makes them pause and think about their own personal safety. When you look at what was seized, the weapons, kilograms of cocaine, you have a thousand pills, you have the money, you have everything here that goes into you know, a criminal operation. Craft brewers in Newfoundland are saying beer lovers can't get enough, but the people with the pocketbooks are saying that the province has hit peak beer. We'll have more on the future of local suds coming up.
Welcome back. Well, on the way into the studio, Ms. Brawweiler, I looked outside our window and I could see our flag poles. <laughs> Not the flags, the poles kind of, it's windy out there. It is very windy yeah. out there. We take a look at some of the numbers. Uh, 48 what? sustained right now, kilometers per hour. Uh, for St. John's and we're generally seeing winds out of the west southwesterly and with those gusts you're seeing gusts close to uh, even 70 kilometers per hour. So these strong winds unfortunately are going to stick with us as we head through the night tonight. Uh, but those temperatures were lovely this afternoon and they're still quite nice sitting in the uh, teens for some areas. Most of us are seeing those double digit temperatures and we should Stay uh, pretty well, relatively mild uh, through the night tonight. 15 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay as well. So here's the setup. Now we've got that southerly flow, as I mentioned, out ahead of a, a cold front that's moving through. If I zoom out, you can see just how large. Uh, first, it's an occluded front, and then it goes down into a cold front, and that all extends all the way down through the states. And we've got a ridge of high pressure, a blocking ridge of high pressure, and that is. Uh, what we're going to see over the next little bit is this rain starts to move through. So here it is here. The rain will move through as we head through the night tonight. By the time tomorrow morning rolls around, we're going to see even more rain for the island. Labrador, though, you're going to stay uh, relatively clear through the night tonight. The best chance of seeing some of those showers will be for Lab West. But yeah, those temperatures, like I said, uh, staying in the double digits overnight tonight, those West southwesterly sticking around as well, anywhere from 40 to 60, even 70 kilometers per hour through the night tonight, especially in those exposed areas. And then southwesterlies along the uh, west coast between 30 and 60 kilometers per hour, again, closer to the coast. 10 degrees for St. Anthony tonight with that chance of showers. Most of Labrador should see partly cloudy skies tonight. 10 degrees is the overnight low for Happy Valley Goose Bay. That's where you should be sitting is your daytime high. 2 degrees for Lab City. That's the best chance of where we'll probably see some showers. Lab West uh, with those southwesterlies 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Now as those showers continue to move further east tomorrow, we should uh, see things taper off for the west coast and then staying uh, relatively unsettled for Labrador. A mix of sun and cloud through the day with that chance of showers, mainly for southeastern Labrador and then Lab West as well. And then eventually we'll start to see a little bit heavier showers through the overnight. But the good news is, is there's a clearing trend. So once we get that out of the way, we're actually in for a couple of nice days of weather. So here's a, a look at the rainfall projection as we head through tomorrow morning. Uh, heaviest will be the Port of Port Peninsula through to Stephenville, somewhere between 30 to 50 millimeters of rain by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. And most of us seeing a trace to maybe 10 millimeters at the most with some areas seeing between 10 to 20 millimeters of rain. But again, that's going to uh, taper off and give way to some beautiful weather as we head into the middle of the week. So those winds are going to stay strong tomorrow afternoon. Again, gusting somewhere between 60 and 70 kilometers per hour. In behind that system, though, those winds will ease quite nicely, and that will be the trend uh, as we head towards the end of the week. So temperatures tomorrow, even a couple of degrees warmer than what we're seeing today. Again, those gusty winds near 70 kilometers per hour. Uh, teens right through central, even to the west coast 11 degrees for Stephenville up through uh, St. Anthony 13 degrees and then most of Labrador actually looking at some sunshine tomorrow 9 degrees for Nain 4 for Lab City so you're going to get into some of that cooler air with that chance of showers through the day but again staying quite gusty so once we get through today like I said uh, nice weather on the way for the rest of the week I'll have all those details coming up thanks Ashley well craft breweries are popping up all over the place these days and many of them get their starts with loans from Macoa. And that has led the federal government agency to ask the question, how many tap rooms are too many? And that has left one Bayvert startup in limbo and making the counter argument that the market is only just getting started. Here now is Malone Mullen with that story. It looks like just an old house on the bay, but there's a big vision for it. Brandon Philpot and his five business partners are taking a chance on turning it into a tap room. Central Newfoundland is essentially a craft beer wasteland. From Bay Vert, it's a two-hour drive, at least, to the nearest locally brewed IPA. Sounds like an open market. The problem is money Phil Pot and his partners thought they could access is out of reach. They're saying that uh, we don't know now is the best answer we can get at them, so we're not going to fund it. They is a COA. It's loaned millions to craft breweries across the Atlantic. But Phil Potts says the agency won't even look at their application. 
Philpott received this letter from ACOA in June. The federal agency indicated it's pulling back on funding breweries, saying it's time to wait and see how the industry here fares. But Philpott says ACOA's offices in other provinces are still accepting applications. Philpott doesn't like ACOA's argument. He says that most of the funding so far has gone to places like these on the Avalon. The Craft Brewers Association here agrees. Peak beer is still a ways away. It does seem a little bit weird that funding has stopped, but, uh, but I understand that this has happened in other provinces as well, and then it's resumed uh, as, as short as a year later. So you can pay I, I think I think definitely there's room for more breweries in Newfoundland right now, so hopefully ACOA will start uh, reinvesting again soon. ACOA isn't doing interviews or even confirming whether it stopped lending breweries here money, but Philpott fears if the agency's position doesn't change, it'll stop the booming beer industry in its tracks. ACOA single-handedly killed the brewery industry in this province from any further development. And we are so far behind the other Atlantic provinces, it's not even funny. In an old mining town like this one that's trying to revive itself, the applicants say a taproom could make all the difference, breathing life into a place off the beaten tourist trail. Malone Mullen, CBC News, Bay Vert. There we go. Well, Carolyn Stokes is live, as you see there, in Bay Roberts tonight at the site of another craft beer location. Carolyn. Thanks, Anthony. As we just heard, ACOA hasn't been too keen on uh, granting funding to microbreweries in the province. And joining me now is someone who knows a little bit about that, uh, Mark Burry, the owner of Bacaloo Trail Brewing Company here in Bay Roberts. So first of all, can you tell me a bit about your start uh, when you started the business and the challenges that you faced? Sure. Uh, we started in 2018, about November. We, uh, we were working on the building, doing a lot of renovations for the part, first part of 2018. Um, and some challenges we face, we, we face similar issues with ACOA. We were turned down for our initial application um, and then turned down several, uh, several additional times in the future uh, when we were looking for money for expansions and so on. Um, so uh, financial challenges for sure. Um, we ended up getting some great lenders with CBDC and BDC, uh, although at much higher interest rates. So uh, that becomes a monthly interest expense. Um, another challenge we had was uh, basically the, the, uh, the challenges we face with the NLC right. on our monthly commission side of things. So not only do we have a higher interest expense as someone who's got money from ACOA, but we also have a higher uh, commission expense than almost any other province uh, for beer commissions. Right. So, so if you had been able to get some funding from ACOA, that would have essentially saved you money in the long run in terms of interest payments. Sure, yeah, I think it would have helped accelerate some growth there. Um, I don't think the market is entirely saturated or anything. I think it's more on the, the problems more on the side of taxation and, and lack, of, uh, lack of funding at reasonable interest rates, especially when interest rates are at an all-time low globally. So. Well, that was my next question, actually, is about the saturation of the market here in this province. So you don't think it's saturated? There, there have been so many uh, microbreweries opening up uh, in the past while, so you think that there's room for more? I think there is. Uh, I don't think the problem is saturation with the market. It's really a, it's a problem of a more of a um, sort of higher expenses as a result of having to seek alternative funding from different sources and as a result of having to pay higher commissions. Um, there's lots of room for growth. I think uh, Molson and Labatt still have you know, quite a large market share in Newfoundland and uh, Newfoundlanders do consume a lot more beer per capita than almost any other province. So I think there's more room for growth. I think, and, and I think the, it's something that the government could be doing more to help with. And how has business been for you over the past year? Well, we did really good this summer. Um, we had a really busy summer. We saw, we've seen a lot of tourists from different places, uh, you know, different countries, Australia, Germany, the States, everywhere. So the summer was huge for us. Um, and, and our challenge is more in the, in the slow season. Um, but yeah, we're still, we're still doing well. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, lots of people coming out to uh, Bay Roberts to visit your brewery. Thank you so much for speaking me with me about this. And uh, coming up a little bit later, we're going to talk more about the effects of the economy from uh, this microbrewery with uh, the mayor of Bay Roberts. That's coming up. Reporting live from Bay Roberts, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now. More news from Fortune Bay where a diver has been injured during the massive cleanup of dead salmon. What the divers do and what they were told about the scope of the cleanup. That's next.
Welcome back. Returning now to our coverage of the South Coast salmon cleanup in Fortune Bay. News that a diver was injured on the job has prompted CBC to do some digging into just what it is those dive teams are doing there. And here's what we've learned. There are two kinds of divers working the salmon cages. You've got scuba divers and commercial divers, sometimes referred to as on the hat divers. So we'll take a look at this. The scuba divers are working inside the salmon pens. Sometimes they can get down to about 100 feet and that injured diver most likely may have come up too fast from his dive. Scuba divers face greater risk. They carry their own oxygen and they have no communication with the operations on the surface. But most of the divers are commercial divers. Take a look at this. They wear these 30 pound helmets. They are fed oxygen through a line and they do have communications with the operations on the, surf on the surface. Now, here and now has learned that some divers are wearing hazmat suits because the decomposing fish, what the divers call salmon butter, is noxious and it ruins their diving suits. And we've also learned the company circulated information to the dive teams indicating there have been severe mortality events. In other words, uh, these kinds of events at Northern Harvest 72 salmon pens and in other words, a lot of dead fish. Employees have been warned, the worst case scenario, there could be 1.8 million dead salmon. The fish market size, approximately 10 pounds, that means a potential of about 18 million pounds of rotting salmon to clean up. That's 9,000 tons. Now the company refused to discuss numbers and won't confirm how many fish it actually had in the ocean before they all started dying. And when the Here and Now team was on the south coast, we didn't see any environment or DFO officers. And it's unclear if there is any environmental oversight uh, at this operation at all. So to continue this, DFO says that it is monitoring the situation. And yet in an earlier statement to us, DFO said they were not involved because there's no evidence of improper drug or pesticide use. DFO pointed the finger at Moe, the company, saying removal of dead fish from the cages is the responsibility of the company and there is no authorization from DFO required for the cleanup. So that's one agency. According to the Fisheries Act, there's another department, Environment and Climate Change Canada, that could be involved but only if there is a deposit of deleterious substance. The act says a deleterious substance can be any substance that if added to any water would degrade or alter its quality such that it could be harmful to fish. The department sent us a brief email this afternoon, essentially no comment. We also contacted the provincial environment department to see if that department is involved in this cleanup. You may recall a brand new minister there in Derek Bragg who replaced Perry Trimper. We are still waiting to hear back from them as well. Well, if you're a beer lover, you're now paying more for your brew. A story about the increase in beer prices coming up. Plus, we'll speak with the mayor of Bay Roberts about the business of beer.
if you are going to be buying alcohol in the province tonight, you're likely going to be paying more for it. New prices went into effect yesterday. A six pack of domestic beer, such as Coors uh, products, they're up by 31 cents, while a dozen, that's up by 48 cents. The increase is part of an annual price review and it goes right across the board from beer to liquor to wine, but not all products are going up. The Liquor Corporation says in some cases the prices have actually dropped a little bit. Labatt says there is a simple explanation for the increase. Costs are also going up. Uh, you know, the price of everything, electricity and fuel and, and wages and so on, everything, everything uh, taken into account um, goes up. And, uh, and so we try to maintain profitability by, by uh, raising prices at the uh, by the same amount. Well, tonight we're also talking about a different kind of domestic beer, craft beer, and what that industry has been doing for small towns with breweries. Carolyn Stokes is live in Bay Roberts this evening. Carolyn. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah, as domestic as it gets, for sure. I'm in Bay Roberts tonight. Uh, we're talking a lot about beer and the craft beer industry. And uh, joining me now is the mayor of Bay Roberts, Philip Woods. So first of all, can you talk a little bit about your observations, how this business has had an effect on Bay Roberts? Well, I think it's great news, of course. As we all know, craft breweries have become very, very popular. They attract a lot of people to a community. And by having one in the community, uh, Bay Roberts can also uh, boast of its own uh, craft brewery. And uh, it brings a lot of people into the area. A lot of people now, we have regular scheduled tours coming into the area. They do the distillery. They do the Bacaloo Trail here in Bay Roberts. And they go to another brewery. Uh, perhaps yes, in Dildo, for example, and we have the on-schedule tours come. A lot of bachelor parties come here, bachelorette parties come here, so we get a lot of people, and we certainly hope that those people come back and visit us again. And what does that do for the economy? Every mayor of a town wants to get more people and businesses to come in. What, what kind of a difference has it made to the economy of Bay Roberts? Well, for starters, of course, they pay taxes. <laughs> and everybody's hoping to build up their tax base. So that's one good thing. But we also hope, as I mentioned, these people come back to visit us. And of course, while they're here as a part of a tour, there's an opportunity for them to visit some of the restaurants that are here. They can probably get gas. They can even have a coffee for your designated drivers, right? So, so we hope that, it's, that there's a spin-off effect. And of course, we've seen it a spin-off effect because we've seen a lot of visitors come here that are into the craft breweries from all parts of the world. And these people come here, they just don't come here. They come for the entire town and the entire Conception Bay North area, in fact, because there are many things, of course, they can be a part of, and there's many things that they can see here. Yeah, earlier tonight uh, in the show, we were talking about a small company on the Bayver Peninsula that was hoping to start up their own um, microbrewery, but they were having some trouble getting a COA funding, that sort of thing. But the, a microbrewery in rural Newfoundland, in rural places in particular, uh, how, how big of a draw is it to places that may not get as many visitors uh, without something like a microbrewery? Yeah, well, they bring people here. They bring life. They bring revitalize the area. This building, in fact, was closed down. It was all, well, virtually boarded up. They brought it to life again. And of course, you know, these are the kind of things, plus jobs. They bring jobs. I think there are six people working here now. So that's six people that are getting uh, an income out of this particular place. And of course, they have musicians come here, play on regular occasions. So those people make a few dollars and you have your food trucks that come here from time to time. So there's a, there's a part of the big pie that everybody can be a part of, and, th and that's one of the things here. And as I say, we get a lot of PR sometimes from the brewery, as we just saw in, in Dildo recently. Big PR. <laughs> big PR there, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a lot of PR, but of course it's good for all the breweries. And it, as I say, it, it, it's another attraction that people can see in Newfoundland and Labrador. So do you think there's more room in the province for more of these kinds of businesses? Oh, I certainly think so, because right here, you know, they can't keep the product tour sometimes because of the uh, number of people that come here. And of course, they can take beer home with them through the growlers and other different uh, bottles of uh, beer that you can have. So, uh, 
you know, I, I think there's room for it, and I think it's big business. All right, well, Mayor Wood, thank you so much for coming by and speaking with us about this. Well, welcome to Bay Roberts, and thank you for coming to Bay Roberts. Thank you. <laughs> Reporting live from Bay Roberts, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now. All right, safe travels home, Carolyn. <laughs> Well, the first opportunity to vote in the federal election started over the weekend. Polls opened Saturday morning at Memorial University in St. John's. It's one of more than 100 university campuses across Canada hosting what Elections Canada calls special ballot voting. People who show up to vote on campuses can vote in whatever riding in Canada they are residents in. Voters handwrite the name of the candidate they select instead of putting a mark on a ballot the way the rest of us will do. And this is the second time that Elections Canada has done this to make voting easier for people who live away from home. I think it's amazing. I mean, everyone should have the opportunity to vote. So it's great that we can vote for the people that we know of too. Cause like, I don't know the people here. So like, I would be kind of uneducated. <laughs> so it's great. I'm not gonna be here and on, on election day. <clears throat> I'm not gonna be in my own district. Um, and uh, I felt like I should vote in my own district. So I was looking into, uh, ways to do that, but to stumble upon this while I'm here for a uh, conference over at, uh, at the med school is uh, excellent. Well, staying with the election, federal political party leaders spent much of today hunkered down, all of them prepping for this evening's big show, the final English language debate before Election Day. I'm looking forward today, finally, to be able to debate Justin Trudeau in English. Uh, he has skipped out on two prior debates because he's afraid to defend his record. Now, only Andrew Scheer was out making promises early today, vowing to eliminate admission fees to national museums if his Conservative Party is elected to power. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau just had one campaign stop, meeting with Ontario teachers in Ottawa. And tonight, they will all be among the six main party leaders in Gatineau, right there in Quebec. They are all taking part in a federal election debate with more participants than ever before. Each leader is going to field questions from so-called ordinary Canadians and the moderators as well in five separate debate segments, each with their own theme. Those themes include affordability, the environment and energy policy, indigenous issues, leadership, as well as political polarization, human rights and immigration. That two-hour debate begins at 8.30 p.m. island time. New figures out today suggest that women in Canada still earn $4 less per hour than men. It's a gap that's persistent, but it is narrowing slightly. According to Statistics Canada, women between 25 and 54 earned about $27 an hour last year. That's 13% less than men, meaning women earn 87 cents for every dollar that a man earns. Men, on average, earn $31 an hour. And that difference is partially due to the fact that men and women work in different industries and more women work part-time. 20 years ago, the gap was 18%. Climate protests are taking over bridges across the country. From east to west and in between, commutes came grinding to a halt for thousands of Canadians. The demonstrators say the disruptions are necessary to get their message out. They want urgent action on climate change and they want it now. CBC's Kayla Hounsel reports. What do we want? Climate action! In Halifax, protesters moved to disrupt the morning commute to take a stand. That it's time to act. We don't have the luxury of time as far as our climate goes, as far as the pollution goes, especially the water. We need clean, safe drinking water for everybody. But police were a step ahead. Officers shut down the McDonald Bridge, a major artery into the downtown core, before protesters even arrived. Well, a lot of people have been inconvenienced, and I can tell you, speaking personally, that the agenda that some of these folks have been trying to bring forward that we were coming on board with has uh, flipped the switch this morning. Protesters wanted lanes for pedestrians and cyclists to remain open, but police shut those down too, citing public safety concerns. Riding a bike eliminates uh, any cost to the environment. So in the big picture, it's an economic issue. The health care costs that come with um, hydrocarbon, burning hydrocarbons, the, the savings that aren't recognized. They call the protest Bridge Out. The group behind it, Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion is 100% peaceful and nonviolent. 
It's an international movement started in the UK last year, demanding countries, including Canada, bring in policies that will reduce carbon emissions to net zero within six years. Healthy forests, rise up! From the Burrard Street Bridge in Vancouver to the Bloor Viaduct in Toronto, thousands of Canadians struggled to get to work. I'm sure glad you guys are doing your job. I know. In Edmonton, some drivers got out of their cars as they were blocked from the Walterdale Bridge. If he wants to make changes, go and do some research, go work for a university, go work, run as a member of parliament. We're going to be far more inconvenienced by the devastation created by the climate crisis. In Halifax, more than a dozen were willing to be arrested. A small price to pay, they say, considering what's at risk. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. It's been 18 years since three teenage boys died in the icy cold waters near Pooch Cove. And that's how old Jenna Elliott's brother was at the time of his death. It was a story that gripped the province nearly two decades ago. Three teenagers had fallen through the sea ice in Pooch Cove. Rescuers tried to get to them, but they couldn't. All three died. 18-year-old Jesse Elliott, his 16-year-old cousin, Adam Wall and their 16-year-old friend Adrian Sullivan. Now, 18 years after his death, Jesse Elliott's sister writes in painful detail on our website about her memories of the event and just how her family managed to get through it. And you can find that article on our website. That's cbc.ca slash nl. Okay, earlier, Ashley, you mentioned the uh, possibility of better weather? Yes, yep. it definitely looks like it. Uh, not a whole lot of systems in play mm -hmm. over the next little bit, and I'll, I'll kind of show you why. So if we take a look at the weather systems right now, we do have a large area of low pressure just to the um, over Quebec right now with a couple of fronts associated with that, and that cold front, as I showed you a little bit earlier, is extending all the way down through the states. Now we do have a blocking ridge of high pressure in place and then another ridge of high pressure in behind it. 
Once we start to get those showers, move them through, this ridge of high pressure is going to move in, and this is what's going to be responsible for the beautiful weather that is on the way over the next couple of days. So there's those showers moving through tomorrow, and then we start to see those skies clear late Tuesday into Wednesday, and uh, there's that ridge of high pressure. So if I zoom out, the next weather maker is actually this area of low pressure. It's going to be blocked by this high pressure that's moving over us, and then that will be our next weather maker, but that won't really move in until at least Saturday, it looks like as of now, because it just sits and spins off the coast of uh, the states there. So uh, as far as those temperatures go heading into Wednesday, we're gonna hang on to these double digit temperatures. This is around seasonal for this time of year, but plenty of sunshine through the day on Wednesday. 12 degrees for St. John's, 11 for Corner Brook, nine for Cartwright. Slight chance of some showers late in the day. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting around 12 degrees, and then we'll see those temperatures climb for Lab City as well. Maine will see your double digits around 10 degrees. Now over the next five days, here's what it's looking like. So after the showers tomorrow, a big stretch of sunshine in the forecast. Again, there's a couple of uh, days. Whether Saturday stays completely sunny or not, We'll definitely have to keep an eye on that. But uh, yeah, afternoon highs somewhere between 10 and 14 degrees with those overnight lows still chilly, uh, staying in the mid single digits through the uh, overnight. And then for uh, central Newfoundland, essentially the same thing, but your temperatures are going to be a little bit cooler. And because we've got those clear skies and calm winds for the most part uh, in the overnight, we could see uh, the potential for temperatures dipping into the zero, maybe even a little bit below zero over the next couple of days. For western Newfoundland, uh, temperatures reaching as high as potentially 16 and 17 degrees by Friday and Saturday. So a beautiful start to the long weekend. And then up through uh, eastern Labrador, you're looking at about 12 degrees and then temperatures climbing well above seasonal for you. Looks like temperatures around 18 degrees by Friday and Saturday. And then uh, a similar forecast for Western Labrador. Now tomorrow, again, going to hang on to that chance of showers and cooler temperatures. And then eventually we tap into that ridge of high pressure, bringing those temperatures up. Your overnight lows still in the single digits, though. Uh, 16 degrees by Friday and Saturday, looking at a little bit more cloud cover and 14 degrees. So let's look at your forecast. We'll have a weather photo coming up. Anthony. Thanks, Ashley. A couple in Alberta is fighting Air Canada over a flight upgrade that they paid hundreds of dollars for, uh, but they didn't get. And they didn't get a refund either. And as Rosa Marcatelli tells us, a little known rule says that that's okay. How tall are you, Rick? Six foot four. So it's no surprise then that this Air Canada ad caught Rick Brosetto's eye. Are six foot four or four foot six? Get all the comfort you need. On a trip to Hawaii in April, the Borsados paid an extra $500 to upgrade from basic economy fare to comfort economy, which offers perks like seats with more legroom for the added cost. When the airline had to change planes and couldn't deliver, the couple says they were told they'd get a refund. Instead, they got 20% off a future flight and a $200 e-coupon. Just being treated like you're an afterthought, like you just... We have your money and that's, sorry you weren't happy. Maybe we'll do better next time. Here's a discount. The airline points to a little known rule. It's on page 30 of 116 pages of rules that passengers automatically agree to when they book. It's written by Air Canada for Air Canada. And in it, it says those services aren't guaranteed and there's no compensation. WestJet and several other U.S. airlines have similar policies. Unfortunately, that's the... Uh the conditions by which the uh, Canadian Transportation Agency has allowed the airlines to promote their fares. Air Canada says it makes every effort to ensure that services are provided to the best of its abilities. And the no compensation rule was included for additional clarity. The couple and dozens of others have filed complaints with the Canadian Transportation Agency. They want the regulator to use its powers to force Air Canada to drop the rule. After hearing from Go Public, Air Canada offered the Borsados a full refund if the couple agreed to sign a non-disclosure agreement and drop their complaint. They refused. The rule has to change. 
Canada's new passenger protection regulations don't address the problem. You put your finger on one area for future improvement, which is the, the way that various uh, fare classes are advertised for the carriers to make clear what you're getting and what you're not getting and, and what your recourse is if you don't get what you're supposed to get. In its written response to the Borsado's complaint, Air Canada says its rule is reasonable and that it had to change planes after the 737 MAX jets were grounded. The Borsados are now waiting to hear what the regulator decides. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Well, I want to know where you're to. Take a look at this shot. This is, uh, I learned something actually, photography blue hour. Uh huh. So it's a great shot there. It was sent to us by Aubrey Daw. And I'll tell you where it was taken when we come back. Wind down here now with a bit of a riddle. <laughs> so what's fluffy white and loves goat milk for breakfast? It's definitely not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you could go fluffy perhaps. Uh, no, take a look at these. Uh, China's newest lions. Uh, they're very rare. Not only are they twins, but they are, as you may notice, white. Uh, so they get little cuddles there from the uh, science lab. They like wrestling around, rolling around. And as soon as they're strong enough, They'll head back to mom and dad that you saw there. And the zoo quite thrilled because apparently uh, these white lions are very difficult to breed in captivity. And there are only just a few of them left in the world. So maybe a little good environmental news for a change. If only they stayed that little. Yeah, look at those animals. <laughs> Beautiful. Strong cats. They're stunning. Yeah. Yes. So you mentioned, what was the blue hour? The blue hour. The blue hour. Yeah, let's take right. a look at that photo one more mm -hmm. time. So I, I uh, looked into it. Apparently it is where the sun is past the horizon, obviously, okay. and it creates this blue hue. You can see the Constant. blue there. Yeah. No question. Beautiful shot there. Thank you so much for sending that in. It was actually taken in Bali. Beautiful Bali. Beautiful Bali. It is gorgeous out there for sure. Uh, yeah, so Aubrey Daw ah. sent us that photo. Yes. <laughs> 
when he's not shaping the minds of uh, kids at Beachy Cove Elementary. Aubrey's up early taking great pictures like that one. Yeah. Nicely done, sir. Yeah, that's right. And if you have any beautiful photos just like that one, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yeah, so uh, it's going to be a bit windy on the uh, little cycling trip home. I <laughs> hadn't planned this very well, so. No, it is Monday, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Don't worry, the rest of the week, not so bad. Okay, good. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good night. Good night.